When it comes to science fiction stories involving extraterrestrial life, I'd say that most aliens tend to fall into one of six categories. Human-like, humanoid, machine-slash-artificial, eldritch, animal-esque, and floral. While that probably isn't the best way to classify different types of aliens, that isn't really the main focus of today's video. However, what is the main focus are these aliens, the floral ones. In today's video, I aim to explain how alien species such as the Florana, Methanotians, and Mycelium could theoretically exist in real life, as well as how they possibly came to be within the Ben 10 universe. Of course, a simple answer would just be, the writers wanted a living plant alien, but I always find cheap answers like that to be boring, as accurate as they may be. Yes, perhaps that is all there is to it, but with my channel, I aim to explore and expand upon topics such as this in order to create a more interesting world-building perspective for those seeking more from their favourite franchises such as Ben 10. This video is all about elaborating on something that doesn't necessarily need an answer, but I personally just find it interesting to ponder on questions like this, and I find it fun to theorise on such topics. As such, please keep in mind that, at the end of the day, this video was just made for a bit of fun. With all that said, it's hero time! First of all, I feel like it's best to make something very clear from the get-go with this video. Plants are alive. They're not necessarily alive in exactly the same way as we humans and other animals are, but they are made of living cells, something that can't be said for things like rocks and water, which are instead simply made up of molecules and atoms. When it comes to the majority of animals, most operate thanks to having a brain, the organ that controls motor function, memory, intelligence, and other bodily functions. Plants do not have brains, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's impossible for them to become intelligent in the same way as animals are. Animals contain a nervous system, the network of neural pathways that allows your brain control over different parts of the body. Think of it kind of like being the string that manipulates a puppet's movements, with the brain being the one actually pulling the strings. Though plants don't possess brains, they do possess something somewhat similar to a nervous system. The cells of a plant are able to produce electrical impulses called action potentials, which produces a similar effect to the nerve cells within an animal's nervous system. In the case of plants, action potentials are induced by typically either injury or via artificial depolarization. To briefly explain artificial depolarization, it's essentially just injecting current into a cell in order to stimulate it and trigger a reaction. You can create a similar phenomenon when hitting your funny bone, the ulnar nerve near the elbow. But then you may ask, why do plants have a nervous system of sorts if they don't have a brain? Think of it like an early warning system. When a bug lands on a leaf and starts to eat it, the action potential triggered acts as a warning of sorts for the other leaves, as well as a kind of SOS message to the plant's roots, which then secrete useful bacteria in order to basically ensure that the plant continues to survive. The leaves also trigger similar SOS messages for droughts and harsh temperatures, allowing the plant to adjust accordingly to its current environment. At its most fundamental, a plant's quote-unquote nervous system exists to allow the plant to make the necessary adjustments it needs in order to survive as optimally as possible. And this is done without the use of a brain thanks to action potentials and hormone impulses. In the same way that humans have conscious, subconscious, and unconscious actions that they use in order to function, you're now breathing manually by the way, plants rely entirely on unconscious actions in order to operate. What I'm essentially trying to say with all of this is that though they don't work exactly the same way, both plants and animals are able to react to stimuli and adjust accordingly. Now, let's look at some particular animals that I think will help our point here. Animals such as the sea star, sea cucumber, sea lily, sea urchin, sea anemone, sea squirt, sea sponge, coral, and Portuguese man of war are all examples of animals that can function without brains, so it isn't even necessarily just plants that are able to operate without them. In order to theorise on how plant-based sentient organisms such as the Florana and Methanosian are able to exist, I think the best real-world example to look with would be the giant feather sea star. Giant feather sea stars are echinoderms, same as starfish. Echinoderms are essentially just invertebrate marine animals, that being marine animals without a spinal structure, that possess a hard, spiny covering or skin. Echinoderms, like the giant feather sea star, don't have heads or brains, but instead use a network of sensory organs that have olfactory capabilities, olfactory being related to the sense of smell. In essence, this means that echinoderms use their sense of smell in order to interact with their surrounding environment. This is a very important piece of information when it comes to how plant-based sentient life could possibly exist. Let's now refer to Ben 10 Alien Force, the second series in the Ben 10 franchise. In particular, let's refer to the Season 1 pilot, 
where we get our first introduction to the Omnitrix's methanosian DNA sample, Swampfire. After calling his name, listen to the first line that Swampfire ever says in the series. Ew, what's that smell? Is that me? From this, we can see that methanosians like Swampfire do indeed possess a sense of smell, which means that they may well use olfactory sensory organs in order to perceive their surroundings. Of course, this then raises the question of, if they use their sense of smell to see, why do they have eyes? Plants have a type of cell known as photoreceptors, which are able to detect different wavelengths of light. Human eyes do something similar. When light hits the retina of the eye, photoreceptors turn the light into electrical signals, which pass along the optic nerve in order to enter the brain, which then creates the images that you see. By this logic, it could perhaps be that with species such as Florana and Methanosians, similar photoreceptor-filled structures exist within the eyes, but instead of this information being rooted to the brain, it is instead rooted throughout the entirety of the species' nervous system, which would in turn, at least theoretically, create a sort of visual spatial awareness. Next, I want to address the Methanosians' advanced healing capabilities, and how I believe that this allows them to move around like humans and other animals. We see Swampfire as capable of anatomical deformation, reformation, reattachment, and regeneration. This is actually an ability found in a wide variety of real-life flora and fauna, though obviously not to the same extreme degree as Methanosians. Plants are able to undergo a process called de-differentiation, which allows their cells to return to a stem cell state, meaning that they can re-diversify into new and different types of cell. Through this, plants are able to regrow lost parts, which is probably what we're seeing here with Swampfire. We also see that Swampfire is able to stretch his body out and then withdraw it once more, which he is likely able to do through an extremely fast-working de-differentiation and re-differentiation process. In the case of reattachment, what we're likely seeing with this long vine-like section here is the nervous system of methanosians, a tight network of nerve cells that allows for more precise determined motor function. Speaking of which, let's now discuss how these species are able to move without muscle. We see from when Swampfire takes damage that his body doesn't contain a muscular system, or at the very least, he contains a muscular system unlike that of most earth animals. Plants do contain motor cells connecting between the leaf and the stem of the plant. These cells take in water and swell up, then shrink down once water flows out into the rest of the plant. This shrinking and swelling allows for the leaf of the plant to move, though not in a manner as drastic as what we're seeing here. Perhaps these species are able to achieve motor function in a way similar to that of the walking palm, a type of tree found in the tropical rainforests of Central and South America. These trees are able to grow new roots in the direction that would benefit them with the most sunlight, with the old roots lifting up into the air and dying off. Let's remember that Florana was seen living near pools of magma on Xenon, and also that Methanosians literally come from a planet where geysers of flame frequently erupt from the surface, so both of these species are definitely suited to tropical environments, which is where the walking palms grow. By this logic, we could suggest that these two species underwent a similar evolutionary speciation, becoming able to move their bodies more flexibly thanks to this ability to sort of grow based on what function you need to perform. With their rapid de-differentiation and re-differentiation, as well as their clear capability for anatomical reconstitution, I don't think it's a far stretch to suggest that Florana and Methanosians are able to move by instantaneously breaking down and reconstructing parts of their bodies in order to move them more flexibly in different directions which can be done efficiently through the precise and complex nervous system that they possess, which makes them intimately aware of their entire body of functionality. What we get from all of this, in a simplified sense, is a hyper-complex plant whose entire body is essentially a living brain, made up of genetically adaptable cells that are entirely operated and reassigned as needed by a complex system of action potentials. They are able to see and perceive the surroundings thanks to photoreceptors and enhanced senses of smell, as well as likely the sense of touch granted by their nervous system. But then this brings up another question, that being, what do they eat? I feel like immediately the joke answer of they're cannibals that eat other plants is going to come up a lot here, but to be fair, let's actually look into that. If we assume that on the world that Florana and Methanosians originate from, those being Flores Vedans and Methanos respectively, most life forms are plant-based organisms, then it wouldn't be any different for a Methanosian or Florana to eat another plant-based species as it would be for a human to eat a pig. It would only really become cannibalism if it was a Florana eating a Florana or a Methanosian eating a Methanosian, but other plant-based organisms would just be a food source. Same as how, of course, a human eating a chicken nugget is not necessarily a cannibal. Although... Speaking of which, let's observe the teeth of these two species. Venus flytraps, the species of plant that I can only assume directly influenced the design of Wildvine, 
is the only plant, at least to my knowledge, that possesses something akin to teeth. Though I suppose the thorns of plants such as holly and thistle could also count. Let's note that in animals, sharp teeth usually indicate a predatory carnivorous species, though some herbivorous animals such as camels possess them as well, as do omnivorous species like humans and chimpanzees. Through this classification, we can determine, based on the structure of their teeth here, that Florana are likely carnivorous species, and that Methanosians are likely vegetarian. This idea can be supported by the fact that the Florana we see on Xenon definitely seem well suited to ambush-based hunting tactics, further lending to the likelihood of their predatory nature. Most regular plants are able to absorb nutrients from the ground, as well as use their chlorophyll-filled leaves to absorb energy from sunlight. Though in the case of carnivorous plants, they of course instead gain energy by consuming animals. In the case of Florana and Methanosians, they're clearly carnivorous plants due to the fact that they have mouths, which would indicate that they likely also have digestive tracts. It's likely that Florana and Methanosians eat in order to gain energy, though their bodies are green and therefore likely are filled with chlorophyll, so it is possible that they both gain energy from sunlight as well. We do see that Swampfire is capable of extending the roots on his feet, so he may even be able to absorb nutrients from the ground like other plants as well. Or this could be a vestigial trait from, of course, when he was a less evolved plant. Finally, I want to bring up the topic of plant reproduction. At its most simple, and explain it in a way that won't get me demonetized, the wind and or insects carry pollen from one flower into the air, and if that pollen happens to land on another flower, it will potentially fertilize the flower, and then seeds will grow. Most plants possess both male and female reproductive organs, likely to maximize the likelihood of fertilization occurring between cross-pollinated individuals. The reproductive organs of flowers are called stamen and pistils, by the way. When it comes to animals, bright colours are used to either woo mates or as a warning to deter predators from taking a bite out of a toxic species. When it comes to plants, however, bright colours are often used to draw the attention of insects in order to maximise the chances of a plant either spreading or receiving pollen in order to reproduce. When we look at the Methanosians, their brightly coloured petals perhaps signify the same thing. Considering that Methanosians literally blossom upon reaching maturity, I'd say it's very likely that this is also an indicator of their sexual maturity, and as such, the brighter colours are more pronounced in order to draw the attention of pollinators. When it comes to the Florana, we see that the seed pods on their back are capable of growing vines at extremely high rates, so it may be that they are able to reproduce asexually by just growing more of themselves, or perhaps they use these pods in some kind of more intimate fertilisation process. Now that we've gone over everything I think I needed to express when it came to these two species, let's move on to the mycelium. Most of what I can say about these guys I've already said previously with the Methanosians and the Florana, and this video is probably already fairly long and boring as it is, so I'm going to speed through this one nice and quickly, especially seeing as we don't really know all that much about them in the first place. Fungi aren't a type of plant, despite what most people think. I'm only bringing them up in this video because they're so similar that, for the sake of not having to make another video that would just go over a lot of the same points again, I'll just quickly add them on with extra info here. Fungi possess a similar photoreceptor system to plants, and they grow the fastest in moist, damp environments, so they would likely develop the same walking palm system of movement as the Florana and the Methanosians, due to living in a similar environment. The mycelium was able to make wide varieties of different fungi, including giant mushrooms with mouths and the humanoid fungi that we see here. Seeing as these are artificially created, the evolutionary process can probably be skipped entirely when making these creatures, and therefore I don't really feel the need to elaborate too much on them. They were simply artificially made to have the traits explained previously that benefit a plant-based species. The only other thing of real note is that mycelium can telepathically communicate with all forms of plant life, which I believe is likely done through the use of enzymes. In real life, the Ophiocordyceps, or the zombie ant fungus as it's more commonly known, takes control of an ant's mind and manipulates its behaviour in ways that benefit the growth of the fungus, and it does so by using enzymes, so the way the mycelium telepathically communicates with other plants, such as the Florana, is probably the same. With all of this said, I hope you guys have perhaps learned a thing or two about plants today, and I hope you enjoyed watching this video. I've got a load more hopefully interesting Ben 10 discussion video ideas, as well as ideas for other videos on different topics, so please stay tuned for those if you're interested. But for now, that is a wrap.